when you know you're in a beauty, you know you're in a power. And when you know you're in a power, you know you're in a beauty. And for me, the realization of that inner power and that inner beauty is the taking of more power. I know that I go around differently. I feel different. The difference is a wonderful difference. And, um, yeah, it's like I'm walking on... It's like I'm walking on cloud nine all the time. It's wonderful. It places me geographically, I feel. Aotearoa, Māori, very much so. Hopefully it tells everyone I'm a Māori. I have that whakapapa. <laughs> it upholds my whakapapa. It's about people coming to terms, you know, with a whole lot of things. About who they are, their own identity. Because let's face it, this is a badge of identity. Really. Probably, you know, over and above everything else, it's a badge of identity. Around here, particularly in Ohini Mutu, there was we had lots of queer. I was brought up with lots of queer around us with Moko. We saw it every day. The last one was one of my aunties down the road here. And she used to be in the concerts with us. But um, when you've been brought up with it all the time, it's just normal. And uh, it's not until everything's gone. And other people, this new look like a resurgence of it, um, then you start thinking about it. And you actually think that everybody was brought up with them and um, that it wasn't new. I didn't even notice it going. I just didn't even notice it going. All of a sudden it was gone and um, then it took my mind back to all the queer that were around at the time I was growing that, um, about the moko again. I never ever saw a queer with moko in the Ātahi. Now, whether that was because I had a Mormon upbringing and we just didn't go to those things, to those places where there were queer uh, around with moko kauai, or for whatever reason, it just never happened. Uh, I never saw them, and I think that perhaps I was terribly sheltered. And the only place I saw them was in books with prints of Linda and, and Goldie and the queer of those, of those paintings. But other than that, nothing. My nanny, nanny from the island, Matiwiki, uh, gardener, dad's mum, remember her quite vividly. She is probably the um, most recent of our, our family line to, to have worn moko kauai. And I remember when she came, used to come to visit us here to Whareto. I used to just sit at her feet. I was absolutely, totally overcome with it. I wanted to go and rub my hands all over it. Um, but she sort of was a queer that you didn't feel comfortable doing that. But I remember it so distinctly. I loved it actually. I really wanted to follow the contours of the pattern with my finger because it was so deeply um, incised in her chin and all her little whiskers that you know it, it was yeah I, I remember it so vividly in the way that it um, it struck me you know I used to stare at it all the time <laughs> well for me to um, my moko kauai began with my husband when he got his um, full facial muko and he had asked me if I'd consider having a muko done and um, that was in 1986. In 1990 he asked me again and um, I'd had plenty of time to consider all the issues by then and thought yeah 
I saw it as a way of maybe becoming his equal. He took it with him having a moko there in Māori terms. As his wife, I had every right to have a moko to stand beside him. And because um, he's from the East Coast as well, his mum's side is Ngāti Pro, his father's side is Tūhoi. It was very much a common practice amongst some of his people. The reasons why they did in, in, um, in traditional times are probably as, as varied as the women who take them. Um, for me personally, and I, and I have heard that, um, in fact one of the things that mum said to me was that I wasn't old enough. She didn't think that I was old enough. And whether, I mean, you know, that's what she was meaning, I'm not sure. My grandmother was actually only 15 when she took hers, so um, I think things have changed and I, you know, for me it was really connecting with my own wairua. I knew personally why I wanted to take one um, and it had nothing to do with my thinking that I earned one, absolutely nothing to, to do with thinking, in fact that didn't even come into it. Um, to me it really is ultimately a way of honouring all of those women who have worn one before me and connecting to them personally, at a personal level. To me, it is also my own personal way of honouring Māori art form because I owe my livelihood, the sustenance of my kids to Māori art form. So it was very much um, that sort of thing for me. It was also a way of honouring myself as a Māori person, making a commitment to language, making a commitment to tikanga, making commitment to a certain way of life because I feel very much when I wear moko kawai, I have to wear it with a, a level of responsibility. So there are a whole range of things that I would not open myself up to. Um, there's certainly a way that I choose to live my life and really it is about a commitment that I have made to wearing this moko kauai. Um, it's been about very um, consciously being a positive role model for my own daughters, my nieces and my girl mokopuna when they arrive. <laughs> But really, you know, it is, it is about being um, a Māori woman in the most positive way that I can possibly be, in the strongest way that I can possibly be. And I can only determine and define those, um, what those mean to me. It was like a whirlwind courtship between me and the idea and the actual wānanga and the actual time of the moko. It was very whirlwind, because it just happened. Bang, 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 just like that. I always wanted it there, but I always was conscious about the reo all the time. I was Because everybody was pushing the reo is, to have the reo, you have more understanding of it. Even though within myself, um, I still wanted it. Um, I came to the realisation that First and foremost, I'm Māori, and um, it's my right. And um, I d even dreamed about being like the old people, having moko and being able to stand up and, and uh, uh, karanga and, and kōrero Māori. I mean, I saw it all around me, and, and it's always been... I used to dream about that. I wish I could be like them. And um, when the opportunity came, I... I thought about it really hard and it wasn't until um, we had a, we were doing our case for um, some land over in um, Tumukaituna, we had um, our case, we'd won our case and we got the final word in about November, um, about a week later my kuya, my great grandmother who had a moko, she came and I just I just instinctively knew it's time for me.
the whole importance of Mokokawai to me is about reclaiming. It's about uh, being who I am. It's a statement of who and what I am. And it's the culmination of a long struggle to regain, to recapture um, what I perceive to be Māori. I've done that, personally for myself, and uh, secondly, for my grandchildren, so that they have an opportunity, so that they grow up with clear memories of Mokokomai being alive and well, being active, being beautiful, and that there is not a stigma of, um, of, of a negativity concept in terms of kite mau moku. We can't divorce ourselves from our heritage. We are what we have been born to. We are our whakapapa. We are our heritage and all of those things that encompass um, that. And whether it's 1800s, 1700s, previous to that, the 20th century, the 21st century, we're still Māori people. And the sorts of things that are important to us are still the sorts of things that were important to our old people. Um, and I think if we can still embrace those confidently, then there would never be an issue. I mean, you know, things like language. I don't see the difference. It's all part and parcel of who I am, whether it's language, whether it's, um, you know, Māori art form, whether it's moko kauai, it's still part of who I am. And the way that I express those things, you know, <laughs> is really entirely up to me as a Māori person. Knowing that speaking English isn't enough for me and, and living in this modern world isn't enough. This is also maybe for the wairua as well. You know, it's not all about work, 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 play, 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 spend, spend, spend. Not everything's about money and looks and well, if it's just for self-satisfaction, feeling good about yourself, feeling good about where you've come from, being proud, and having love. It wasn't because I had the real that I wanted a mokokaimai. It, it wasn't that at all. And I don't think that it plays, I don't think it should play a great part and the reason why wahine, Māori, take moko kauai. The reo does not make a Māori. It enhances your ability to be Māori. Certainly it isn't the, the whole essence of being Māori. But it, no, just because I had the reo doesn't mean just that wasn't the driving force to taking moko kauai. It was a conscious choice. Uh, a choice about about me, about reclamation, as I've said before. It's not a decision that you can take lightly. I, I know. It is not a decision that can be taken lightly. So I would think that a lot of those women have, you know, put a whole lot of heavy thought into it. Um, and it, it's a statement about being positive and being Māori and, and you know, just having the confidence to, to step out and, and tell the world that. Because of my um, not sureness, had a kind of a major identity complex because I've been, I'd been adopted out from birth and um, raised by a Māori family, fortunately. But 
being raised to believe I was a Pākehā, having my original identity taken from me, being raised Māori but being told I was a Pākehā, sort of gave me a lot of confusion as to where I stood. I didn't feel... I knew the difference between Pākehā and Māori because I grew up with certain ways. Um, but not feeling fully secure of the Māori side. And um, when the law changed and I found my natural mother, who's from here, Ngāti Whātua, which I'm very proud of, and um, pleased, pleased to know my roots, that all came, came for me with the moko, that security, that sense of identity, of saying, yes, I am a Māori, I'm not, I don't know, My heritage is, is, is rich in terms of I have a Samoan mother who gave up that stuff, the, pe, uh, the malu and all of the Samoan uh, moko. She didn't, she didn't take any of that, although my grandmother did. She had malu. Um, and so she, before she became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, she pushed that aside as did my father's family. I was brought up Catholic, you see, and um, it was like that was our first priority, being Catholic first and Māori second. Even though I was brought up in a, in, in a, in a marae situation, and I think that was just the change of the times, I suppose. The church came first, and you were Catholic before you were Māori. I mean, it was just the way it was. And, um, and all those sort of things gave you a sort of a, a negative t reaction to who you really were. You didn't know at the time that's what it was, but um, I can look at more objectively now about the, the way I was brought up. One day my mother rang on a Saturday morning and during the course of our conversation, which was completely unrelated, I said to her, by the way, I'm having my moko done. She said, that's nice, dear, which one? I said, no, the one on my chin. Now, she said to me in, in a tone that was not so much forbidding or anything like that, but in an exclamation that went something like this, oh no, if God wanted you to have one of those on your chin, you would have been born with one. To which I replied, don't be ridiculous to me. And uh, she didn't come to uh, the Wānanga when I had my, my mother go on. But uh, we made our peace and when she saw it, she thought it was absolutely beautiful and wanted a big tongue to me. Being here at home, I approached my whānau. Uh, and the only way I knew how to do that was to go to the marae. So I just went down to the marae one day and I walked in and said oh, I had an issue I'd like to ask, get some advice on. And I felt that for me I was going there to pay my respects by informing them rather than asking permission. And um, they didn't know, they weren't sure themselves. I got a room full of men and they said they didn't know it was the first time they'd had anyone come to them with, with a question of sorts. And um, feeling as men that they, that the, me being a female, this was a female issue, so they sent me to our fire, Auntie Ruby at that time, as the queer kaumatu of our iwi. And uh, I went to her and asked her, and she said no. So I was being quite rebellious by continuing my kawai moko from that time on. But I also felt that I hadn't been listened to either, that she hadn't listened to my side of the story first. She had all sorts of reasons um, which I found to be questionable. They weren't definitive answers for me that said no. So I continued on without the total call. 
my queer. And from that point on, I stopped asking people because I sort of felt that I'd learned that by asking people that was the answer I was going to get. Uh, my parents, I'd just sort of drop little hints with my mother. Well, not so much hints, but, you know, I remember at one time we were going through some photos, came across a, a photo of a, of a queer wearing moko kowai. And I remember making a comment to my mother that one day that, I, you know, I would actually like to take a moko kowai. She didn't respond at all. <laughs> and I know that it was a difficulty for them. It was a difficult. They could not understand why um, right here and now their daughter would think it was relevant, let alone important, to take moko kowai. And I took them aside um, one evening and I took great lengths to explain um, why it was important for me to, to take one. And then I sat back and listened to the reasons why they um, thought it was not a good idea for me to take one at all. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, you know, right then and there, for all of the personal reasons that I had, I decided that I needed to take one for them, uh, for their understanding of the situation, the understanding of where I was sitting from in terms of wanting to take one. I shall never forget the day that it happened. It was a wonderful day. Filled with people who loved me. And people that I loved. My grandchildren and children. My cousin who came particularly to do, do Ngāti Hina Karakia for me. Dear friends who travelled, especially to be with me. And uh, my niece, my sister-in-law. And that was a lovely day. I'll never forget the day that, the moment when I stood up, I sat up rather after it was finished. And I had um, Sharon stretching and Deirdre stretching and cousins and my mokopuna. I'll never forget, she cried and she sobbed and sobbed. And she said, don't hurt my nana. I could hear her saying that. And um, when I sat up, I felt that I'd sat up and left my old self lying on that bed. And when I got off that table, the old self disappeared and there was a new me there. I suppose it was the rebirthing of money. And um, to see all the people that mattered most in my life, being part of that, uh, was the most wonderful thing. It was the most, just the most wonderful thing. And I can only compare that um, to the birth of our, foil, of our first mokona, that feeling of euphoria, which continues to happen today. And I just, it's wonderful. I remember really quite seriously thinking towards it, certainly for all of the time that I moved back home here, probably five years before that, in terms of sorting out for myself how it might be done, when might be the most appropriate time to do it. There wasn't a lot of information there actually, no matter where I asked, there, there was actually not a lot of information there. Um, so I just really tuned into the old people and ask them to give, my, give me direction. A couple of weeks before, um, I actually went up the mountain. It was winter to snow. <laughs> the thought was to get water from Te Waifakato Te Rangihiroa, which is the lake right on top of Tongariro. 
Um, I'm not, I didn't have it in my head how the water would be used during the ceremony, but I just needed to have water from the top of the mountain. The whole thing happened um, in combination with a, a, a wānanga on tonga pūro on the marae here. So we had Hirani Melbourne and Rangi Iria Headley, who's a cousin from here as well. And of course, Rangi, who's a, a maker of instruments. And um, yeah, combine the two kaupapa, and I think that was just wonderful. You know, it, it, it really did take it to another dimension for me personally, to have all of those, um, to have Hirani playing his kōwauo and his pūtōrino, and yeah, it was magic. We actually had the, the, the table set up in the corner underneath Timari, who's the queer that I was named after. I just wanted to be there and to have her look over me at that time, set up in the corner underneath Timari, who's the queer that I was named after. I just wanted to be there and to have her look over me at that time. When the photograph was um, developed, her moko, kowai, was white in the photograph. And when I saw that, I said, so I knew you, you know, I knew you were there for me. Thank you for your blessing. But I really did feel that they were in there, you know, at that time. So I've had my moko done in two stages, which was the kauairaro and kauairunga. And then Laurie Nicholas, um, I just needed the top lip to be touched up a bit in 97. And I knew him at that time because his wife was learning to weave with us at UNIT and um, I asked him to touch up my top lip and he went over the whole thing again for me with a professional gun at that time and that was the first time I'd ever experienced with a professional gun and it was very painful, <laughs> very painful, very difficult moko to take I think with those guns because it's very noisy makes a lot of noise and um, so your mind can't sort of sit, get away from what's going on and place it out there whereas I found with her husband's homemade gun it was very gentle because it was quiet, it didn't make a lot of noise. We had a wānanga here, eh? because I mean, it, they were, there was four women getting theirs done, and I just knew at that time it wasn't for me. Even though they thought that I should get it done at that time, I just said, no, it's not time for me. And uh, like I said, after we'd won the case for Tumukautuna, my kuya just came. She was just there for an instant, and I just knew. that, and. We just rang, rang up um, Gordon and um, told him it's time. He was busy at the time, he didn't come until almost a week later. And um, when he did it, there was nothing. And when I say there was nothing, I didn't feel a thing. There was absolutely nothing. When I got up, after he'd finished, um, there was no swelling, there was no blood, there was nothing. And it just felt, yeah. I didn't feel like anything, only that I knew it was there, and with everybody else there, it was, the way it was already there. And even a week later, it's like it had always been there. People said, you know, it's like it's always been there. It's like it's normal, it's natural. It's not like, people have never actually said to me, gosh, when did you get that? It's just, oh, kia ora, from Paias, Māoris, when they talk to me, when I first had it, even now, it's like, it's normal. And that's how it was for me. The first negative response I might add 
was from my muku rahiri pauhiringa waka o Ngāpihi. After the tohu had finished and we'd had our kōrero and my, and I'd had a big tangi, it was, um, we went out and sat and uh, the kai was prepared and I was sitting feeling just absolutely um, drained from all the crying that I had done, crying of happiness I might add, and Rahiri walked past and he said, looking at me, my, my kawai was quite swollen, my lip was very swollen, I looked like Daffy Duck I'm sure, and he said, God, it's so big, does it have to be so big, and it's so wide, and your lips swollen, will it go down, it's so ugly, Nana, how come you got it like that? And I said, go away. <laughs> it was a lovely time. People admire it. I've had mongrel mob members come up to me in the middle of the street and kiss my muku. Um, boys, young Māori boys in cars, when they see two Māori women sitting in a vehicle at an intersection and they're coming towards us and they've got the staunch look on, our, on their faces and they do this to you, and they smile, and they raise their eyebrows. I have not had a negative response to mine. Um, it's all been positive. Right down to one of our real old kui over here. I mean, every time she sees me, eh, she touches my moko and she says, oh, I love your moko. And I mean, that just makes me feel wonderful, eh? And I mean, that's one of our, our kui over here. And she says that, Auntie Witterina, she always says that. And it's lovely to see that even at her age, it's almost, this is my, this is what I perceive anyway, that time has gone on so, so fast, I suppose. And um, it's almost like you can see that you wish, they wish that they'd, they'd had one. Because she says that she wishes she had a little we have offered it to her. At the yeah. time we took yeah. our kawai muko, it was still it was being very oppressed at that time, yeah. and we were almost considered like rebels, I guess. Which which didn't bother us any because we were already associated with the negative sides of society. Yeah. yeah. Being. Um, the lower socio-economic group and um, criminals associated with gang members who were criminals as well and all of that sort of being out outcast wasn't wasn't a bad thing to us mm. it was quite kind of normal too at first for me when I'd be attacked in that I was quite reactionary I'd just be people would like to come in your face and really tell you what they think yeah and they hadn't really thought about it yeah that's right. and and we and I'd just react and be back in their face sort of thing kind of brick wall having it sort of protect yourself and um, over the years I've sort of mellowed out yeah. on people a lot and given them a bit more the chance to think to about what they're saying to. We still get yeah, it. Yeah. We still get people who haven't been exposed to people with tamoko, kawai moko, and all, and um, they're not prepared, fully prepared, to deal with their own feelings about it and their own thoughts about it, and they're reacting to you. The very first time I stepped out into the public eye, very self-consciously. <laughs> Um, probably about a week after I'd received it. So it had completely healed, but I was very self-conscious about, you know, going out into the public arena and just zipping across to Taupo there. Walking past a group of about eight 
young Maori women, about 18 year olds they were, and all of them just swung their heads around to me and just said, wow, awesome. And to me, that was like, that was it. You know, to me, that was one of the reasons. Well, I mean, that was just such a lift to have those girls give me that level of support. And after that, you know, walking out, stepping out in public just wasn't a problem at all. To me, it was just, yeah, the fact that they were the first ones who responded to my new face in public in the way that they did just gave me such a lift and I was never ever shy ever again after that. I've got a lot of really positive responses from Pākehā people too, you know. Um, I must say that one of the, the reasons um, that I felt a little bit tentative about taking it would be the attention that I would get because I am not an out front person generally. I'd rather be, you know, sit quietly in a little corner and do my own thing. I really do believe that if people go into anything, moko kawai included, with an open spirit and an open heart, then the way will be found to do it. So really it, it lies very much with each, in, you know, each individual woman as to how they go about finding their own ways to getting there. I wouldn't like to lay down any hard and fast rules and I don't think it's for me to do that. I have no right to do that because it's part of a personal journey. Well, I know it was for me part of a personal journey and, and maybe it is for other women as well. I think it's to do with, uh, a lot to do with confidence. It's a lot to do with Māori women these days knowing what they want and knowing what they don't want and being strong and upfront about expressing things that are important to them. You know, I just think, well, maybe I'm just echoing my own thoughts, but I know that to be so of all the women that I have known who have taken moko kowai, you know, they are very strong, positive Māori women. I've had a few women ask me that or say to me, oh, I've always wanted to have one myself. But the ones that have asked, what should I, who should I ask? If that's my answer to them, yourself. Because it's you that has to carry it. and it's your journey. It's not anyone else's as such. And I think as adults, we need to make decisions for ourselves too and live by those decisions. I was raised with these things. My parents were fluent speakers of te reo. Unfortunately, we missed the waka there. And um, just total admiration for, for the way um, our tūpuna live, the things they believed in. And yeah, and I think it's just come with having kauai moko as well as part of that commitment to, to my own culture. It's about feeling as beautiful as Māori women are and how beautiful um, the moko makes you feel. It puts you in a different sphere. It puts you in a different frame of mind. I've heard it likened to floating on air, to who sees clothes walking on cloud nine. You become, you take on this invisible cloak um, of, of wonderment and you walk, you glide, you do all sorts of things. You, it's, it's just wonderful. You have, well, I try to explain how I feel. And I'm constantly in a state of euphoria. Um, and it shows, if you're ready, take that step. Nobody else is going to wear it, just you. If you're brave enough to think about it, 
then be strong enough to carry out that thought. Uh, and um, realize your inner power and your inner beauty by doing something that you want to do, that is yours. It's something you can't even describe. It's your own. Your tongue is going, the waidu is going, the modi is going, you've got all the, all the whanau around you, you've got all the friends that should be there with you as well, that create this huge, like, it's like a huge crescendo. And this, 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 this um, huge orchestra is going, and you get swept up in it. It's just beautiful. And it gets to a peak, like, right to the top, that, that, that little, um, that note that it gets to. It's just, and just keeps you there. And when it was finished, you were still there. And it was just, it was almost, it was there for days. It was so wonderful. And even now, you know, it, it's still there. It's just an awesome thing. It's just wonderful. It's something that you can't even, yeah, it's your own personal thing that you will experience yourself. Nobody can make you feel it, you just know it. And don't let anybody tell you it's not there, it's there. It's just there. And I can't tell you when it should happen or anybody. You just know when the time is right. There's no <laughs> red light come on. It's just there. to